Um, right. It's seven. You know how it goes. It's the Dharma doors. <clears throat> it's the it's still the inexhaustible Dharma doors. I'm MC Owens here in the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And tonight we start a new sutra. Because that's right. On Sunday nights here at the San Francisco Dharma Collective, we study sutras. And we've got we got locked into a sutra for a while. But tonight we start a new sutra, which means we open a new Dharma door. That's right. Uh, and so here it is. Uh, this is the title. This is the sutra of, it, you know, there's, you know, how, which priority do we prioritize Sanskrit, the Chinese, the English? This is the sutra that in Sanskrit would be called the Bhadra Mayakara Vyakaranya Sutra. That's the that's a good guess at how one would translate this sutra, the title of the sutra in the Chinese. In the English, this is the sutra called the sutra about the prophecy of the attainment of enlightenment concerning the magician Bhadra. Noam, I think we're gonna go with the magician Bhadra Sutra. That's, that's what this one should be called, like in the, the YouTube subheader, part one, the magician Bhadra Sutra. That's kind of what this is about. It's about a magician named Bhadra. He's here. <laughs> I, I, uh, I have a lot, I've got a lot to talk about tonight. I'm hoping I get, get to even describing what's going on here. Um, so, you know, first things first, of course, we are still, um, uh, I guess we are still climbing the peak of jewels, right? We're, we're climbing the, Rat, the Maha Ratnakuta Sutra. So, because this is a new sutra, new night, let's start from the beginning, shall we? There is a beautiful anthology, a collection of sutras called the, the Peak of Jewels, a Mountain of Jewels, otherwise known as the Great or Maha Ratnakuta Sutra. And by the name, Maharatna Kutta Sutra, you would think it's uh, a sutra, but in actually it's a collection of 49 sutras. And more or less for the last uh, while, I have dedicated the Dharma doors, Sunday night inexhaustible Dharma doors, to going through these uh, sutras. I don't know if I'm going to do all 49 necessarily it's you know it's not like that um but these are a collection of sutras that are wonderful beautiful you know so much dharma you know and so i felt like i wanted to dedicate a nice chunk of time sunday nights to going over these different sutras and tonight we are dealing with the 21st of those sutras there's a little bit of debate about whether these 49 sutras should be conceived of consecutively or as a pile in which there is no priority. I'm kind of of the mind that there's no priority to these 49 sutras. They are indeed kind of like just a pile, a heap in that sense. And so the Maharatnakuta Sutra, the pile of jewels, the 21st sutra, is a, what would be called a Vyakaranya Sutra. So you might've noticed from the title here. Uh, so let's just break it down. It's called the Bhadra Mayakara. You might know the word Maya as a, the idea of an illusion, right? Um, if you're familiar with uh, Upanishadic philosophy, Indian philosophy, Maya is not just the name of the mother of the Buddha, 
interestingly enough. But Maya is this idea of like um, a, an illusion. And, and then indeed in, in Indian philosophy, they speak of Maya, like the grand illusion, right? The grand play of Leela of life in that way. But Maya is illusion. And apparently a Mayakara is one who works with Maya, one who works with illusion. So you could also translate this as the illusionist Vajra. And this is a sutra that's called a Vyakaranya Sutra. And I mentioned this many, many, many Dharma doors ago that in the Maharatnakuta Sutra, in the pile of jewels, you get a bunch of different kinds of sutras. A lot of them, I kind of would almost say most of them in a way, are what are called Paripricha Sutra, uh, questions. The, um, the questions of Bodhisattva so-and-so, or the questions of the Asura so-and-so. So you get these sutras in which somebody comes to the Buddha with a question, and then the Buddha answers the question, and that's the point of the sutra, is that it's a paripricha, it's a kind of a question and answer. There's also in the Maharatnakuta collection, sutras that are called uh, the Simhananda, I believe it is, the lion's roar, and there is the lion's roar of Queen Simala. There is the lion's roar of Bodhisattva Maitreya. The, uh, there's a few more lion's roar. So this is actually when someone other than the Buddha actually steps up and teaches the Dharma. And that's a lion's roar. In addition, so there's these kind of different classifications of sutras. You could think of them as types of sutras or subgenre, something like that. And there's a subgenre. There is a class or a group of sutras that are called the Vyakaranya. And this is one of those. And what that word is translated as is it's usually trans translated as prophecy. You know, and prophecy in English is like, you know, talk about a loaded term. Talk about a loaded idea, right? It's like, oh, Nostradamus. And, you know, it's like, okay, easy. We, it's actually, the Vyakaranya is a very old part of the Buddhist tradition. And it's, I'm going to actually, I didn't even think I was going to start here, but I'm going to start here. Um this idea of a uh, prophecy of enlightenment. Uh, this is the sutra that is about this magician or illusionist Bhajra receiving a prediction, a prophecy in that sense, by the Buddha. The Buddha predicts that Bhajra will someday become a fully enlightened Buddha. Yeah, spoiler alert, sorry, but it's, it's in the title of the sutra, what can I do? So there's a whole kind of like subgenre of sutras where it's all about the Buddha eventually uh, uh, foretelling, predicting, <clears throat> prophesying that someone will become a fully enlightened Buddha. But this is actually part of the Buddhist tradition. And yeah, it's one of those things, you know, I'm, I, I'm always trying to illustrate, sometimes literally illustrate, how the Mahayana Buddhist tradition is really taking a lot of early Buddhist traditions from the early schools of thought and really taking them, you know, running with them, taking them to a new level or something like that. I talked about this a lot <clears throat> in the last sutra. And so I just want you to kind of know from the beginning that these Vyakaranyas, these prophesying of, of enlightenment, <clears throat> the tradition, the, the uh, corollary or the cor uh, corresponding 
tradition in the early Buddhist schools is when the Buddha would say, oh, you're now a once returner, or oh, you're a non-returner. The Buddha has made a prediction that monk so-and-so is a non-returner. They're not coming back anymore. Or the Buddha has actually declared you're an arhat. So there's this tradition of the Buddha, the Buddha sort of um, recognizing accomplishments, I guess, would be a way of saying it. So there's a tradition of the Buddha recognizing the accomplishments of students on the path. And I would suggest that the Mahayana tradition of the Vyakaranya, the prediction of enlightenment, is kind of a continuation of that tradition. <clears throat> but rather than forecasting uh, once return or non return or arhat, we are predicting at what future lifetime this person will become a fully enlightened Buddha. So there's this, again, a little group of sutras that are all about the certain individuals receiving the prediction of enlightenment. <clears throat> and that's one of, this is one of those sutras. But this is a very curious sutra because this is the prediction of the enlightenment, the Vyakaranya, of this magician named Bhadra. <clears throat> the name Bhadra, B-H-A-D-R-A, it has a lot of significance in Buddhism. There are a lot of bodhisattvas who have the, the word Bhadra as part of their name, Samanta Bhadra being sort of foremost among them. In fact, if you just look up the word Bhadra in a Buddhist dictionary, not a Sanskrit dictionary, but a Buddhist Sanskrit dictionary, the first entry is Samanta Bhadra. It, it, it's like sometimes they just call him Bhadra. So there is a very, very popular, famous Buddhist or Bodhisattva named Samantabhadra. And if you know about Samantabhadra, I would keep him in mind. I would, I would definitely keep that in mind for this evening or for this sutra. But the word Bhadra, it pops up a lot. I mean, it's not like it necessarily has to be a, a reference to Samantabhadra. The word itself sort of means fortunate or lucky. It kind of means auspicious, but not Shiva auspicious, like spooky auspicious, but more like lucky auspicious in that, in that kind of way. And it's an interesting idea of the idea of fortune or luck or things like that. And Mm, you know, I don't want to get too wrapped up into that because I think that there's a way in which, um, well, uh, yeah, I don't want to get too wrapped up into it because it's sort of, it could be a red herring. And what I mean by that is, is that um, um, lucky is a, it, obviously the word lucky is an English word with English connotations and English ideas. And to actually, I think, go down that road, it might be again a, a red herring where it's, it, we've, we've skipped languages and now we're gonna go down some other avenue. The, the reason I say that is, is that even though this word bhajra can mean lucky or fortunate, there's also kind of a connotation of, oh, like, again, the word has a vibe, the word has a feeling. And when you search for English words, they all aren't quite that. But the word bhadra can also sort of have a connotation of like praiseworthy, uh, respectful in a way. It's this idea of like, yeah, like worthy of respect, praiseworthy, worthy. And, and what I mean is, is that you sometimes will see the word bhajra translated as worthy. 
And it's like worthy, like worthy of what? Well, worthy of respect, worthy of praise in that sense. And I actually think it's that connotation that might be a little bit more at play in this sutra because this sutra is sort of about winning over people about winning respect and admiration and things like that. Uh, in fact, in, in just to give you the basic plot, that's originally what our magician Bhadra is interested in, gaining more respect, gaining more Bhadra in a sense. So um, that's just sort of a quick etymology of the word Bhadra, this, and, and you should also know this too, you know, you know, like in English, you know, these English names, you know, Michael, it, they mean things, right? Our English names mean things, but there's also a way in which they don't mean things, meaning that like in English, we are not a particularly etymological uh, language listener people in that way that we're not like, Michael, oh wow, the image of the divine or something, right? We don't really think that way immediately. And I think that there's a way in which just because the word Bajra means something, it's also someone's name. In fact, if you look it up in dictionaries, it's a name more than it is an adjective or a noun. So, so um, that's the title of this sutra and sort of how it fits into the larger context of the uh, Ratnakuta Sutra and all of that. Now to the story. Um, so I'm excited. I, I'm actually too excited about the Sutra, frankly. Um, there's so much, there's so much here to talk about. So many beautiful, wonderful ideas um, that I really don't even know where to start. I, I really don't. Um, but I, I have two sort of ideas, uh, that I want to try to get across tonight. So the first one is this sutra is a very fun sutra because it is about what would be called a magic competition. That's what it's about. It's a duel, a magical duel between the Buddha and Bajra. Bajra, in fact, basically challenges the Buddha to a duel in that sense. And before we even start this sutra, yeah, in fact, sorry, we're probably not even going to start it tonight because there's so much you need to know going into it. And it's not that you need to know all of this, but that if you do know all of this, the sutra is so much more wonderful in that sense. So what I mean to say is, is that even before the heap of jewels and the, the Bhadra uh, Magician Sutra comes along, there's already a kind of well-established tradition within the world of Buddhism of the magical debate or the magical competition. There is one particular magical competition that seems to be the origin of this. And so what, what this is right now, uh, pretty much tonight, I guess, that because there is this wonderful trope, this wonderful kind of idea in Buddhism of the, of the magical competition, Tonight, I'm kind of doing what could be called kind of a genealogy of that. It, 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 in, it would be called a history of it, but I, my approach is not historical. It's actually genealogical about where do these ideas kind of like morph from? There's original ideas that morph into ideas that morph into ideas. And that's kind of more of the idea of a genealogy. And so I want to share with you what seems to be the, the kind of the origin of this tradition. There is, there's sort of some extra canonical sutras that are the source for this. Um, in other words, they're not like mainline suttas that you're going to find in the Nikayas. 
you're going to have to look a little like on the fringe. And that's actually an interesting part of this magic competition uh, tradition is that it's never really the main line story. It's always sort of at the edges. And so um, uh, this is what's called, if you want to look this up, by the way, to find the sources, this is what is called the miracle at Shravasti. Shravasti, of course, is one of the main sites of Buddhism at the time of the Buddha. Um, the Buddha gave more teachings at Shravasti than any other of the viharas, any other of the uh, monastic compounds. And this particular day at Shravasti, well, it wasn't a, a, a normal day. And I actually want to tell you the longer story that brought this about because it has a lot to do with, yeah, it has a lot to do with this sutra. So it all begins actually with a, uh, I forget who it was. It was a king or a prince or somebody. And they suspended this uh, copper bowl uh, by on like a very, very high flagpole. And they challenged all of these uh, uh, siddhas, the, these miracle workers, these uh, wonder workers, what, today's, what today in India would be called like fakirs, these sort of magicians. They, the, the king uh, basically challenged a fakir or what today would be called a fakir, but a, a, a magician to retrieve the bowl. Um, and nobody could do it. And basically the story is, is that the king or the prince, whoever it was, started to lose faith kind of in the supernatural in a way. And so there was a arahat. So this is early, this is the very, very early Buddhist tradition, by the way. There was an arahat named Pindala. Uh, Pindala, I wrote his name down somewhere. Um, but not on these notes. He, oh, there it is. Uh, Baradavajya. Pindala Baradavajya. And, but he's just known as Pindala. Uh, Pindala had developed the Siddhis. He had developed su supernatural powers. And so he got it in his head, this kind of this idea. And so he actually performed a Siddhi and flew and levitated and got the bowl and brought it down. And everybody was like, wow. And Pindala, who it was, you know, Pindala was not a, a bad guy in that sense because he actually used the opportunity to convert, if you will, this prince to Buddhism. And so it's an interesting event, but actually what happens is, is that the Buddha hears about this event and he said, basically says, oh yeah, no, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> We are not doing um, that type of conversion. We're not showing off in that sense. And he actually, uh, because of Pindala doing that, that's when the Buddha made the rule against showing or sh uh, speaking about or showing your supernatural powers. So that's the origin of the, the rule against not doing supernatural powers, but actually showing them off or talking about them or bragging about them actually, which is what the Pindala story is ultimately about is actually that he was bragging about his accomplishments. But here's what happens. The Buddha makes a rule that the monks can't do supernormal powers. And so, this, this band of magicians, six magicians, they challenge the Buddha to a magic off, but they do it because they know the Buddha has made this rule against doing supernatural powers. So they know 
the Buddha won't do supernatural powers and they'll defeat the Buddha and then they'll be victorious. There's a, it's a, some funny, funny stuff going on in these stories. So they challenge the Buddha thinking he will either uh, not accept or he'll accept, but he won't perform and they'll, therefore they'll win. The Buddha accepts the challenge. And it's actually an interesting part of the story that Shariputra and Kashyapya and Madhguyayana and all of these other arhats who were skilled in the Siddhis, they had developed the supernormal powers. They basically said to the Buddha, let me do the, the challenge. So you don't have to break the rule. They're like, I'll, I'll break the rule. And then you can discipline me for breaking the rule, but we can defeat the heretics. The Buddha says, no, 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 I have to do it. And now I have to tell you another story. So another story that took place before this, it, it took place seven years after the Buddha was enlightened. And it was, this is the story, by the way, and trust me, I've looked this up and you'll find contradictions to this story, but that of course would miss the point of it as a story. The story is, is that seven years after the Buddha was enlightened, it was the first time that he went back to Kapilavastu, to, the, um, to his father's house, to the kingdom, right? So if you know the story of Siddhartha, the Buddha ditched in the middle of the night. He ran out, ran out on his kid, ran out on his wife, ran out on everybody, right? So seven years later, he comes back, a fully enlightened Buddha. And the story is that his father and, and the other elders of the Kapilavastu community, the story is, is that they would not bow to the fully enlightened Buddha. And so the Buddha performed one of many miracles, but this is considered the Buddha's greatest miracle. The miracle consists of kind of, well, it's complicated. It's not very complicated. Um, well, let me just explain it to you to the best of my ability based on everything I've read. So the miracle is something like this. In, in the original version, when the Buddha did it for his family, he levitated and then from the upper part of his body, he shot out water. And from the lower part of his body, he shot out fire. And then he starts um, reversing them and starts creating this kind of a, a vortex of water and fire that in the descriptions, I mean, I know you've done this, I know you've seen this, but if you've ever taken a hose and, and sprayed it and seen a rainbow in the light, well, it looks like the Buddha did some wild thing where he created a panoply of multicolored lights by shooting water and fire out of parts of his body and then spinning it and creating a kind of halo of lights. The most important part about this, uh, archetypally speaking, is the shooting of fire and water out of the body. <clears throat> this this uh, apparently awed everyone. And at that point, his father, everyone <laughs> is recognizing that this person has achieved, a, you know, achieved something very, you know, special in that way. So that's the first time the Buddha performed this miracle, or at least, um, how can I say this? I, 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 it's something that I wanna uh, mention to you. This particular feat, this particular phenomena of shooting fire and water out of the body, it's, it's, a, it's a very special miracle 
that is said to only be able to be performed by fully enlightened Buddhas or fully enlightened beings in that way. And there's actually, you can find this miracle in other religious traditions. In fact, I think there's apocryphal, um, apocryph because they're not in the Bible, but there are apocryphal stories of Jesus shooting fire and water out of his body on the cross. <clears throat> and when I first heard about that, I was like, I wait a minute, I know that miracle. <laughs> I've 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 taught about that miracle. Why is Jesus doing that miracle? So I don't want to get into any, you know, speculation or anything about that, but I just want you to know that this particular idea, whatever it might signify or represent or even actually be, um, it seems to not be limited to Buddhism in that way. Now, I want you to know that I, I do believe, or I don't want to, the, the, in this context, I should not use the word believe. So I'm, I'm, I think from my research that it's the idea that the Buddha performed this miracle. And there's so much about this that he seems to maybe have only performed it once. And in the Theravada early Shravakayana tradition, the Buddha performed this to convert his family and parents and community and stuff. In the more, I don't actually want to call it Mahayana, but I would actually say it's a late, late Shravakayana, early Mahayana period Buddhism, right? That kind of cusp, cusp period where we're trans, certain groups are transitioning out of the early way of doing Buddhism and into the Mahayana way. This miracle uh, gets presented. So either the Buddha did it twice, or there's two different stories. Let me just let me just put it to you that way. <laughs> and so the second story is that that group of six heretics heard that the Buddha had prohibited magical doing magic, so they challenge him. A bunch of arhats say, ooh, let me do it. The Buddha says, no, I have to do this. And so at Shravasti, he performs this miracle, either again or for the first time. In Shravasti, the story is, is that he actually created a kind of, um, uh, uh, well, he levitated, but he did it via a jeweled bridge that he kind of created first. And so he creates this jeweled bridge, walks to the top of it. So now he's sort of floating in midair, sort of, kind of. And then he does the fire and water trick, creating the rainbow effect. <clears throat> but then at Shravasti, he took it one step further. And this is important for a lot of Mahayana Buddhist uh, imagery, a lot of Mahayana Buddhism. In the rainbow vortexes that he created, he manifests these smaller images of Buddhas. So he, he kind of does this weird, uh, like uh, appearing multiple places at once kind of a thing. Anyways, the six heretics are speechless. They're literally sitting there like just jaws dropped at this uh, event. <laughs> at which point, you, you have to love this. You have to love this. At which point the Buddha says, oh, you guys don't have anything to say? And then he manifests Buddhas that start asking him interesting questions so he can start teaching. <laughs> like, so it's like, oh, you don't have anything to say? Well, I guess I'll just talk to myself. So he manifests all these separate Buddhas that start discoursing with him and his espousing of the Dharma in dialogue with himself causes all these beings, including the six heretics, to basically become converted to Buddhism, <laughs> right? Um, by the way, 
after this event, and this sort of is, this sort of happens in, again, like whether he did it twice or whether he just did it one time, after he performs this miracle, he's, um, he's totally, um, totally drained, like super duper drained. And so he actually, this is right before the, the three month uh, rainy season retreat. And so after he performs this miracle, he actually spends all three months outer body up in the Toshita heaven, teaching his deceased mother Maya what is called the Abhidharma. <clears throat> After the three-month retreat up in the Toshita heaven, heaven, explaining to his deceased mother all of this really like high-tech Dharma, Abhidharma, the Buddha descends a uh, a rainbow escalator back down to earth. And when he gets to the end of the escalator, a monk named Shariputra asks him, where have you been? We've been worried about you. And he says, well, I've been up in the Tushita heaven. And he tells Shariputra everything that he told his mother. In other words, all of the Abhidharma. And that's why Shariputra is the, the chief of Abhidharma. All right, so that puts a whole kind of narrative together right there, all the way from the Buddha prohibiting uh, magic all the way to the Abhidharma, all right? So that's a very interesting uh, narrative right there, okay? And you kind of actually need to know all of that to, you know, really get at all the different ideas that are in this sutra, all right? Okay. So that's the first idea I wanted to tell you about was the miracle at Shravasti because it's going to come up in an interesting way in this, in this sutra. Okay, continuing this genealogy of the magic competition. Um, so this is, <clears throat> this is where things go from there. I want you to know about something called... Um, what, what could we call it? Well, I'll just start with this great book and then we'll move on from there. So this is a beautiful book called Performing the Visual by Sarah Frazier. And it's a beautiful book that just came out very recently, <clears throat> well, 2004, so fairly recently. Um, and it's all about a tradition of Buddhist wall painting or Buddhist murals. And what this, uh, there's, this is part of actually of a larger, um, part of a larger world of study. And that world of study is, it's, it's a really fascinating world of study. It's the world of these things called, well, in English, they're called transformation texts. Uh, but transformation texts is a little misleading. It would probably be easier to translate them as conversion texts. And what this is, is it's a long, very, very old, long tradition of Buddhist storytelling using pictures, using murals. And what, it, what happens is, is that there are a number of stories that exist and they, but they don't exist as a sutra necessarily. Like they don't exist as a text. They exist as a meta text. And, and what I mean by meta text is what they, uh, they meaning archeologists in Central Asia in the early 20th century, not only, did they not only did they discover all of these beautiful Buddhist caves in uh, Dunhuang and Luoyang and, and a bunch of places, 
they discovered these beautiful cave murals that show these stories. And I mean, these are a little, um, it's unfortunate to me because they're very um, old. And so you can't really make it out, but it would look something like a giant multi-panel cartoon almost. That's the magician that the Buddha's up against. That's the Buddha. Again, I know that, I mean, even with me, with the book, these things are a little rough, but what I'm getting at is that there's this tradition of these wall paintings that are clearly depicting a story, but the story doesn't have any correlation to a sutra or to anything. It's just like, what is this? And then in the early 20th century, they discovered all of these, um, um, they're like notebooks for storytellers. And it's kind of like the bullet points of a story. And it might say like bullet point one, you know, is the Buddha is challenged. And then in parentheses kind of, it'll say uh, point to upper left, right hand corner. And so what they are, are instructions and the basic ideas that a storyteller would use to tell a story to an audience to convert them to Buddhism in a way. It was a form of um, popularizing Buddhism in that way. And what's beautiful about these, well, it's a beautiful like, uh, uh, what would we call it, uh, discipline or whatever, but it's a beautiful medium where it's like half art, half performance, ha or half, uh, third, a third, a third, a third, but a third art, a third performance, and a third text, meaning there are things that the Buddha says, and they have to be said right, and that's what would be in these, like, notebooks, there are things that the magician says that has to be said right, and that would be in, in the, the notes. So there is a, a text, right, that the, that the storyteller is sticking to, but they also have, you know, free reign to tell the story however they're going to tell it, and they're using this mural prop. I tell you all of this because this is a book about one mural. And it's a mural that's called the magic competition. And it's actually not one particular mural. There's actually many examples of this mural done by different artists in different caves in different regions. And there's a number of them. And so it's interesting to, to that. Um, it's interesting that we have realized that this is that this was a a um, again a meta text where different communities were telling this story, but there was no primary text. There was no primary sutra or source for this. Now, the original source does seem to be the miracle at Shravasti that I told you about, and it does appear in the Dhammapada. So if you know about the Dhammapada, which are like this kind of miscellaneous category of early Buddhist writings, this story, the story of uh, the miracle at Shravasti, it appears in that. But this, this book is about a whole other magic competition between the Buddha and a guy named Raushaka, I think his name is. Raushaka. And again, this is this is sort of the image of Raushaka. He has all of his uh, ribbons. He's on a square platform. The crazy ladder actually is part of the story. It's part of the, the larger story of the, the competition. So I mention all of that because it would definitely seem that there was this miracle at Shravasti story about the Buddha spewing the water and fire. 
that seems to be the uh, original kernel of an idea about this magical competition that then becomes a bunch of different stories of magical competitions. And mm, I wanna go back really quickly to this guy, Badra, and this idea of what I said about um, reputation or respect or being worthy, right? These magical competitions are very much about conversion. And I mean that kind of as it might sound, meaning like converting to Buddhism or converting to a religion, changing over. These, per, the performance of a miracle tale, the performance of the magical competition story was to convert people who were in the audience watching and listening. But the stories themselves are about conversion, right? So there's sort of like some interesting recursion going on there in that way. Again, this is I, these are all things you really need to get or know to go into this sutra because this sutra is very much coming after all of this. So I, again, I just sort of wanted you to know all of those beautiful different aspects of what's about to happen here, that this is not a, it's a very unique sutra, but it's not a unique idea in that way. All right, let me pause for any questions, comments, answers, ideas. Everybody doing okay? Yeah, Tanya. I, oh, sorry. Um, and I don't know if this would be, if you don't want to go this way, just no worries, because it might get us down a rabbit hole, but I was curious about the idea of rainbows in, in Buddhism. And there's something I've heard of called a rainbow body when some people die. And is that at all related to some of the stuff you've been talking about or is it just kind of more peripherally related? Um, uh, for right now, it's definitely peripherally related, but I don't, I wouldn't wanna say it's not actually related in that way. So the only reason why I wouldn't go down that road is because I'm not entirely sure if, if that makes sense, Tanya. So you, you, you bring up a really good point that there is discussion in Buddhism of the rainbow body. Um, yes, it's sometimes associated with uh, death, but it's also sometimes just associated with the Sambhogakaya, the bliss body and meditation in that way. Um, yeah, I would say right now that any correlation is sort of periphery with the potential that there's more there that Michael doesn't know. <clears throat> Noam, did you have one? Yeah, I'm, I'm just loving the description of these. It, it, it sounds almost like improv or jazz, but with a, you know, with, with the added idea that it's about converting people. And I'm, I'm wondering if there's, that if at the time of the Buddha or before or leading up to or during and after that there was sort of a tradition of, you know, traveling shows that this is, is an instance of, or if, or if it's, this is kind of unique, you know, cause we have TVs and well, I think now we have computers, but. Uh, yep. No, no, this is part of a tradition. It, in fact, it seems to be part of a Buddhist tradition of these very uh, traveling, almost circus-like performances in that way. Um, there's a lot of, um, um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of interesting things I could tell you about this. It's again, there, it's a genre of li Buddhist literature. It's not quite sutras. It's not quite whatever they're called. In Chinese, they're called uh, bian wen, transformation literature. <clears throat> and actually there's people who have done study. These, th by the way, what we're talking about now, the cave paintings and the storytelling tradition I'm talking about, we're talking about 600, 700 AD, 800 AD, 900 AD. That's the time period that we're talking about where this would have been like really, really popular. And this, um, uh, 
um, this early form of, well, these bien wen, these transformation texts are also called just popular narratives because again, they weren't sutras, but they were the kind of like just these like Buddhist tales, but there's people in the world of Chinese literature who are beginning to trace back the origin of the novel, the origin of fiction as we know it to these Buddhist transformation texts because they're some of the earliest examples of just like stories that people would read sort of for fun in a way. So there's a long history here. Um, I got really into a particular um, practice or I got into studying the practice because I was doing the practice, but then I realized that it was part of a larger practice. So these, um, these monks, they were usually monks, but they would also be these kind of like mm, kind of wandering magicians, but they wouldn't do magic. They would tell stories. <clears throat> And they would use these um, flip boards where it would have basically like a dozen different images and they would tell a story and then flip the page and tell the story and flip the page. It's very much like a modern PowerPoint presentation, but without the advantage of a advancer, right? But that was sort of um, something I got very interested in. In fact, I also wanted to sort of mention this tonight as well, because I don't know when else I would talk about this. My tradition here of my whiteboards and my murals, I've been doing this since 1999. So I've been teaching Buddhism since the 90s. Yeah, I came in right under the wire in 1999. But I started teaching Buddhism when I was in graduate school and I did this kind of instinctually on a blackboard in chalk just to sort of liven up the conversation for my students and to try to like really get them to visualize what was going on. It wasn't, it wasn't until years later that I found out about this medieval Chinese Buddhist practice or Central Asian Buddhist practice of murals. And what's really wild is that if you were to read a book like this, um, you would be really, let me actually tell you, if you are interested in art in a particular way, this book might be very interesting to you, this perform performing the visual, because this book is actually a lot about uh, guilds, artistic guilds. And in many ways, it's a very deep study about how these murals were actually commissioned, how they were actually painted, literally the pigments that were used, how did they acquire the pigments? How did they crush the pigments? who drew it. The fact is that there was like a team of people and one person was uh, responsible for the background fresco work. Another person did the faces. Another person did all the little flowers. And so this is a really amazing study of how communal artwork is made, like public works projects in a Buddhist context. It's, so it's much more than just about these B Buddhist murals. Uh, so it's a fascinating study of that. And it's also a study that refers to modern like uh, visual literacy and comic book theory. And what I mean is, is that these old, old Buddhist murals that were discovered, you know, basically not too long ago, they display all these things that are part of modern comic book uh, storytelling the way that narratives are, are connected, the way, the way the reader, meaning the viewer, but the way the reader would be told, like, go this way, then this way, then that way, then this way, like, you know, to scan a whole image, a lot of the same cues are exactly the same ones that modern comic books use to, so that you read the comic cells the right order Anyways, I digress. It's a 
really, really fascinating study of this stuff um, that I'm, you know, again, I'm very interested in it because I believe strongly in it as a, a teaching device. So, okay. I, those are the two things I want to tell you about. The miracle at Shravasti, which is the origin story of these magical battles. And then this kind of meta meta tradition of stor Buddhist storytelling where a really, really, really uh, major part of this storytelling was the magical competition. Um, in fact, second, uh, well, actually this is debatable. There's a very, uh, very popular mural that's about, um, well, uh, they would be known as Mulian. And if you've heard of that Chinese name, Mulian, that is originally Madhugya Yana, the Buddha's uh, disciple that was actually the foremost in the magical powers. There's a story about Madhugya Yana going to the underworld to save his mother who has been reborn in hell. And it's, it's literally like a Buddhist Dante's Inferno where Madhugya Yana is going through the various circuits of hell and very much like Dante's Inferno, it's in these circuits that he has to go through to find his mother. And Madhugya Yana is performing lots of magic. He's doing lots of things. And this was the Madhugya Yana saving his mother which also, by the way, if you've heard of Obon, the, the, the Buddhist uh, Hungry Ghost Festival, the Buddhist Hungry Ghost Festival, which in Japan is called Obon, that's all about Madhugya Yana going to the underworld to save his mother. And that is all part of a mural, a mural storytelling tradition. <clears throat> Same thing. So just wanted you to know that there's a lot of these. And they're very interesting because again, they are not a text, they're not a painting, they're a living performance that again, is a very interesting idea. Okay, let's get to the sutra, shall we? Perfect timing, bada boom. Um, I'm gonna, I guess I'll try to read all of my notes, all of my personal notes are in this book, which is the partial translation of the Maharatnakuta Sutra, right? By the way, if you have the book, this is the first sutra in this book. The, the editors of this collection felt that this was the first one you should read. Um, although it is the 21st in the collection, as I mentioned. Um, yeah, all my notes are in here, but I'm going to read from my printout of the the version you all have a link to. Um, there's not a lot of difference. This is a better translation, by the way, the one that's online at Lapis uh, Lazuli Texts. So let's go, shall we? So again, this is the Maharatnakuta Sutra number 21, the, uh, the Bhajra, the Magician Sutra. Thus have I heard. At one time, the Buddha was in the city of Rajagriha on the mountain of Gridrakuta, the vulture's peak, along with a great assembly of bhikshus, 1,250 in all. All were arhats who were well known to the assembly. The bodhisattva mahasattvas numbered 5,000, and they had all attained great Siddhis, great spiritual powers, which they freely manifested. They had realized the patient tolerance for the non-arising of all dharmas, and they had attained dharanis. The bodhisattvas were named Bodhisattva Simha, Bodhisattva Lion, Bodhisattva Simhamati, Lion Wisdom. Uh, Bodhisattva Wondrous Sandalwood, Tamer, or this is a tricky one. We'll just go with the, the translation here. This is Tamer Bodhisattva, Great 
tamer bodhisattva, surpassing light bodhisattva, revealing light bodhisattva, powerful light bodhisattva, adorning light bodhisattva, brilliant awakening light bodhisattva, assembly leader bodhisattva, tamer of sentient beings bodhisattva, as well as all the bodhisattvas of the Bhadra Kalpa, the worthy Kalpa. Maitreya Bodhisattva Mahasattva was there, Dharma Prince Manjushri was there, and others were at the lead. There were also the four great heavenly kings, Chakra Devanam Indra, lords of the Saha world, and great Brahma the Deva king. Encircling them were innumerable Devas, Nagsa, Nagas, Yakshas, Asuras, Gandharavas, Kimnaras, Mahoragas, and so forth. Uh, let me just pause there just to clarify a couple of things about the intro real quick before we move to the next section. So I've often mentioned that, you know, the way these Mahayana sutras work they tell you right away what the sutra is going to be about. <laughs> and so this sutra has already told you by mentioning that all of these bodhisattvas were skilled in the supernatural powers, had realized the patient tolerance for the non-arising of all dharmas, and had attained dharanis. That's where this sutra is going. So that has already stated the theme. And even the names of these bodhisattvas are within the theme of this sutra. So they are sort of, um, how could you say, like uh, allegorically in that sense, standing for the message of the sutra. Um, you know, I did a lot of talking in the last sutra about the lion image in Buddhism. So bodhisattva simha or bodhisattva lion Bodhisattva lion intellect, those, you know, you, you know, think about those in the sense of lion, referring to the, the talks I gave about that. The one word that keeps, that has, gets mentioned a few times is this tamer bodhisattva, great tamer bodhisattva, and also tamer of sentient beings bodhisattva. So, this word tamer is this Purusha Damya Sarathi. Purusha Damya Sarathi. Okay. Tamer. It's an interesting idea. And I just want to make it clear because it can sound a little intense if you don't quite get the connotation. So the section that I'm about to read, the next section, is the section on the 10 titles or epithets of the Buddha, okay? And one of the 10 titles of the Buddha that we're going to read is a title that is known as the tamer of both gods and humans, in a way. This tamer of humans. And what they're talking about is the way in which we have the idea of a lion tamer, right? Someone who can master the wild beast that is the lion and therefore is the lion tamer. One of the titles of the Buddha is that he's a human tamer because we're out of control. <laughs> That's the idea. And so when they call the Buddha tamer of humans, don't get it twisted. <laughs> it's about the, uh, our minds being out of control. And the Buddha is in, about controlling that, taming that. So it's not as intense as it might seem. It's much more, uh, it, it's much mellower than it seems in that sense. Not to say that taming the mind and taming the emotions not to say that that's not easy, but it's not that the Buddha is standing over us with a whip, <laughs> like taming us. 
which I know when I first heard that is the image that came to my mind. And I don't want you to have that image. So it's, it's much more about the Buddha as giving us everything we need to tame our minds, right? I mention that because Bodhisattva tamer is the Bodhisattva that represents that controlling, that taming. One of the Bodhisattva is also great tamer. And one of the Bodhisattvas is also called tamer of sentient beings. So just wanted to put that. And that's also, again, very kind of relevant to the theme of the sutra. So, because by the way, Bajra is a little out of control. So he's, he's, he needs a little taming. But before we can find out about Bajra, which we got to find out about him. So really quickly, the Tathagata, the thus come one, right? The Bhagavan, the world honored one, right? had a great name, which is to say great reputation, very worthy, very respectable, right? The Buddha, the Tathagata, had a great name that was universally known throughout the world. He was known as the Tathagata, the Arahat, worthy of offerings, the Samyak Sambodhi, the perfectly enlightened one, the one of perfect knowledge, the well-gone one, Sugata, uh, knower of the world, uh, Lokavati, I think that is in Sanskrit, knower of the world, supreme master, tamer of men, teacher of gods and humans, Buddha, Bhagavan, world-honored one, the all-knowing one, the all-seeing one, who had accomplished the 10 powers and the four kinds of fearlessnesses and the four un unimpeded liberations and the 18 unique dharmas. He had accomplished great kindness and great compassion and had perfected the five eyes. He could miraculously make pronouncements, teach others and wield spiritual powers perfectly and completely. He was able to take a 3,000, great thousand world system with all of those earths and all of those cities and towns and grasses and trees and forests and Mount Marus and oceans and rivers and celestial palaces and halls and place them on the tip of a single hair abiding in infinite empty space and poise it there for a culpa or more. And just like his mindfulness during this time, they too would not falter or move. <laughs> All right. So the Buddha, the Buddha has arrived. Yeah. So at this time in the great city of Rajgriha, the kings, high ministers, brahmanas, lay disciples, and all the common people all regarded the Tathagata, the Buddha, with great reverence and honor. They arranged many exquisite drinks, food, clothes, and special medicines, all as offerings of respect. In that city, there was a magician named Bhadra who was well versed in the heterodox theories, skilled in the techniques of mantras, and who was foremost among the magicians, the Mayakara. In the land of Magadha, with the exception of those who could perceive the truth and those who had right faith, such as upasakas and upasikas, all the others in the town in their foolishness were easily confused by Bhadra's illusions and they believed in him. When the magician heard of the merits and these tremendous designations of the Tathagata, the Buddha, he thought, now in this city amongst its sentient beings, 
everyone has a mind of reverence towards me. That Shramana Gotama is the only one who does not yet believe and has not yet been subdued by me. I will now go to compare. I will go now to compare with him and to test him. If he yields to me, then all the people of Magadha will certainly respect me even more. All right, so that's Bajra's big plan, right? To best the Buddha at a, at a magic contest and therefore win over all the people of Rajgriha, right? But then this interesting thing is noted. But then that then that magician Bajra, due to formerly planted good karmic roots, which had matured at this time through the sovereign power of the Buddha, went from the city of Rajgriha to Gridrakuta, the vulture's peak. And there he saw the radiance of the Buddha, which surpassed that of a hundred thousand suns. His round face was pleasant like the full moon. His bodily appearance was full and complete like a Nyagrudya tree. The appearance of his hair was pure like the light of Mani jewels. The appearance of his eyes was deep blue like blue lotus flowers. The crown of his head was such that even the Brahma devas were unable to see it. With 60 types of pure tones, he spoke the Dharma for the multitudes. And although the magician had seen the sovereign power and extraordinary honor of the Tathagata, he still cherished his false pride. Moreover, he thought, I should now test him. If he is the all-knowing one, then he should know my intent. After he had this thought, he then bowed his head at the feet of the Buddha and said, I wish that tomorrow you will, you will receive my small offering. At that time, the Bhagavan observed the magician as well as all the sentient beings of Rajgriha and observed that, they, that their roots had matured. And in order to mature them, he silently accepted Bhadra's invitation. Then that magician Bhadra saw that the Bhagavan, the Buddha, had accepted the invitation. And he thought, well, now this Gautama does not know my intent. He is certainly not an all-knowing one. Bhadra then withdrew, paid his respects, and departed. <laughs> At that time, the venerable Madhulyayana was then in the assembly and had seen all of this. He faced the Buddha and addressed him saying, world honored one, this Bhadra wishes to deceive the Tathagata as well as the assembly of bhikshus. I respectfully ask that the Bhagavan not accept this invitation. The Buddha told Madhulyayana, do not think this way. Only those with craving, hatred, and delusion are able to be deceived. I have long since severed and extinguished those kleshas, and I have attained the realization that dharmas are fundamentally unarisen. Throughout kalpas and kalpas, I have peacefully abided in correct practice. Who? would be able to deceive me. You should now know that this person does not create true magic. The Tathagata is the one who makes true magic. And why? This is due to the present realization that all dharmas are like illusions. Even if all types of sentient beings could accomplish magical techniques like bhadras, they would not match even 100,000th those of a Tathagata. 
Okay, I'm going to pause there because kind of moved to a different section. So I kind of actually just want to pause on that. There was a, a tremendous teaching there. Um, yes, it's sort of the, uh, well, this, this sutra teaches a lot. This, this is a very, um, um, it's an excellent sutra. There's a lot of really good, deep teachings well presented in here, but it's also beautiful because it's being done in this story. It's, it's like this narrative, right? It's going to be a very different energy or a very different vibe than our Akshayamati Bodhisattva, right? This is fun, funny. This is actually a very funny sutra in that way. But there's this one teaching that just happened that I really want to focus on because I think it's, you know, we're going to have fun. You know, there's going to be magic and all of that. But the one line is this line. Let me see if I have any notes from my other book. Yeah, I mean, the line that I just want to focus on, kind of just to kind of close out tonight, because the Buddha gets into another section with Magulliana that I shouldn't get into tonight. But the line that I think is so beautiful is, you know, Magulliana thinks that the, the Buddha just got took, right? That the Buddha just got roped into something, right? And so he's like, you know, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. And the Buddha tells Madhuryana, don't worry. Only those who have desire, hatred, and ignorance can be deceived. Right? Then he goes on to say, I, I abandoned those long time ago. I have complete vision and all of that. So those, of course, are the three poisons. We've talked about the three poisons, right? This idea of kama or this raga, this, this wantiness, desiringness in that way, this devesha, this kind of bitter avoidance, even hatred, right? So greed, hatred, and ignorance, unenlightenment, not really fully understanding what's going on here, being wrapped up in one's own little story or whatever, that's kind of ignorance or delusion. And the Buddha says this thing about only those with greed, anger, and delusion can be deceived, right? Buddha says, I abandoned those a long time ago, so nobody can deceive me. And without going into, you know, speculation about what it means to be a fully enlightened being and what would it mean to be fully without the three kleshas, like, you know, I mean, most, most of you know how I sort of tend to think about these things, which is, well, if I don't understand what it would mean to be a fully enlightened Buddha free of the kleshas, free of greed, ignorance, and delusion, then I try to do the opposite, which is I start to try to see the wisdom in what the Buddha just said, which is, how is it that I, Michael, because I, I'm, uh, this is a self-reflective mode, but I think, how is it that I, Michael, could, could be deceived and probably am deceived often? And how is it that I could trace that back to my greed, anger, and delusion? And right away, in a way, the, the answer kind of, at least for me, opens right up. <laughs> like all of the connections add right up in that way that you know, it's like, what's it, what's a good example, right? I could think of a lot of great examples. So I don't know, you, uh, you trade crypto, you, you into to a cryptocurrency or the stock market or something like that, right? Somebody who plays the stock market or who's into cryptocurrency, I mean, I'm into cryptocurrency, by the way, so I'm not pointing fingers except for this way. But it's an interesting relationship between the greed and the desire to uh, uh, for ROI, right? There's the greed for the return on an investment, right? There's the desire for that. But doesn't that set you up 
for some sort of Ponzi scheme or some sort of, uh, you know, bad stock or some sort of bad cryptocurrency or whatever, but you chased it, you chased the dream and got deceived by some, again, a Ponzi scheme or some sort of pyramid scheme or something to that effect. And if you got took, if you got deceived, can't you trace that back to the fact that you wanted to make that quick buck? that you wanted to make a little more this month than last month. And you were thinking, oh, but this guy's promising me, you know, 10x return, 10x return in a month or two. Right there, you can see that the only way, the only way to, to get deceived in that situation is off of your desire in that way, right? And we could do the same with anger, of course, the way that anger clouds the mind and if you were angry, you could very easily be tricked or deceived into something that that anger could totally be worked against you in a way. Yeah. Can't quite think of a good example like investing in <laughs> cryptocurrency in that sense, but I'm sure there are many in that way. And then, of course, delusion or ignorance, of course, that's the pr premier way that we could get duped or tricked or deceived in that sense. But even beyond that, right, even beyond getting tricked or duped via my greed or being tricked or duped via my anger or tricked or duped or deceived via my ignorance, right? Even before that, I want you to kind of do a deeper Dharma dive into well, you know, all, into all of these teachings about the self, the nature of the self, viewing the world through the lens of the self, and the invariable attachments and clingings and desires, and therefore dukkha, that arises from that view of a self, clinging to that view of a self. There's a way in which you could really trace right back all um, what processes or all instances of being deceived could definitely be traced back to clinging on to a certain sense of self in a way. And the idea is, is that then you can take that step over and be like, oh yeah, a fully enlightened Buddha has sort of let go of that delusion of a self, is not guarding, protecting that precious self because he knows it doesn't exist. I, to a certain degree, am protecting and guarding a sense of self. And in the interest of protecting and guarding that self, I'm setting myself up to be deceived in a variety of ways is the idea or the teaching here in that sense. Okay, uh, questions, comments, answers, ideas about that or magic, magic competitions, anything I've brought up? Nada? Well, I, I mean, I, I really I really can't get into the next section because I, I need to draw pictures and it's just like, it's a lot of stuff going on. Um, um, well, then the one thing I should do then is check my notes because I actually had a ton of notes. Well, no, I covered all of my notes. I think I think the one thing that the one kind of idea, yeah, if I could sort of summarize what I kind of wanted to get, actually, I didn't say it explicitly. Um, I, I snuck it in several times. So let me kind of finish this, uh, this introduction to the sutra by talking about this. Um, you know, so I introduced to you um, a couple of weeks ago when we got into talking about Dharanis, I introduced that my academic study of Buddhism was focused around this idea of uh, the Buddhist magician. It was something that I was interested in um, for a variety of reasons. Um, like you, I was probably just interested in the idea of magic, of course. But then I was also, like I said uh, a few weeks ago, 
I was very interested in the the role of Buddhists in society, particularly Chinese medieval society and the way they kind of functioned. And when I found out that these there was a a class of monk who were storytellers, I found that very interesting. But my point that I want to sort of summarize this with is, I, ah, it's in the sutra. It's in the sutra. I, I didn't even really think about it. So the other part of that idea of how the Buddha, the Tathagata cannot be deceived because the Tathagata realizes. Um, so the reason why the Buddha, the Tathagata can't be deceived is he has long since, you know, cut off uh, greed, anger, and delusion in that sense. But then he also says that because the Tathagata realizes here and now that all dharmas are illusory, right? Yeah, I'll just leave it at that. So on that note about magic, I don't know what you call magic, right? Rabbit out of a hat, love, art. I don't know what you call magic in that way. But I actually think this sutra is, is about that. Meaning whatever you think it is in a way. And that being the case, I just kind of want to like highlight that reference that, and it's going to come up again where the Buddha basically says, yeah, what Bajra's doing, that's not magic. That's just deception, illusion, what we would call smoke and mirrors, right? The Tathagata performs real magic. And that's sort of a very kind of special message of this sutra that it's really kind of why I wanted to focus on it is like this idea of, yeah, what we, what we think of as magical in that sense. And I think that there's a way in which we could maybe think that a light show or something is magical and there's going to be much deeper, um, much deeper magic in this sutra. So I look forward to sharing it with you. Uh, weeks to come. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much. That's the end of part one.